Welcome to Fading Memories, a supportive podcast for those of us dealing with a loved one with memory loss. MBK Senior Communities is dedicated to being the preferred senior living provider in the markets they serve. They create warm, inviting living spaces in desirable locations. They offer a variety of services and programs to enrich the lives of residents and their families. And by getting to know their residents, their personal preferences, and their individual needs, MBK Senior Communities can better contribute to their well-being and provide care that's right for them. They are committed to enhancing independence and quality of life, serving others the way they prefer to be treated, and providing care that is delivered with integrity, dignity, and compassion. Currently serving the Western United States, but expanding. Why not contact your local community for a tour and see for yourself why most of their residents say they felt at home from their very first visit? You can get more information by visiting their website at mbkseniorliving.com or call 949-242-1400. On today's episode, I have a conversation with the CEO and founder of Dementia Training for Life, Lori Guntner Mance. Our original topic was going to be understanding what's going on in the mind of someone with Alzheimer's or other dementias, but our conversation went many places and I think it was fantastic despite its lack of focus because... We talked about so many important things, and I think you're going to love it. I do have to apologize. I personally had a problem with my internet connection while we were recording, so there's some feedback and some stuff that just doesn't thrill me. But again, this conversation was so important that I didn't bother to try to re-record or ask her to come back. So... I hope you enjoyed today's episode. I think it's super important and you're going to get a lot out of it. So stay tuned and let's, let's listen in. My name is Lori Mance. I'm an occupational therapist and a certified dementia practitioner, trainer, and care manager with the NCCDP, which is the National Council for Certified Dementia Practitioners. Um, My company is Dementia Training for Life, and I specialize in dementia care and training other healthcare workers, first responders, people that deal with um, or treat those with memory impairments. It so um, I'm, I've been a family member also. Both my grandmothers had the disease. Um, and then my dad started on his own path. So um, it's been a professional uh, role as well as a personal role. I can relate to my... Um, um, Maternal great grandmother, my maternal grandmother, and my mom all have have or had Alzheimer's. Uh-huh. So it's been a challenge. And my mom more than likely had younger onset. She is okay. seventy five and has virtually no short term memory, and her long term memory goes more than it comes. Okay. So it's it's challenging. So yes. I'm, I'm looking forward in hearing your opinions on what you think our loved ones are going through. I've done a lot of research and starting this podcast and I'm the type of person that likes to know how and why, and that makes it easier for me to cope with things. And I've thought about, you know, it's like, what must it be like to not remember two minutes ago or wake up in the morning and not really understand where you're at and just, ugh, all that sounds horrible. Agreed. Agreed. Um, My impression is that years ago, it was just accepted as part of aging. And um, they really didn't address it. Um, My grandmother on my mother's side was not identified until she got lost in New York City for three days. Oh. Oh. So, um, and there were lots of signs when I look back at it, but it was something that you just didn't talk about. Um, now since there seems to be two sides of the coin, um, there are those individuals that just stick their head in the sand and don't want to address it, don't want to identify, uh, what's happening. 
And then there's others that notice the differences and get scared and um, are seeking some answers. So um, I, I'm hoping with all of the talk about the diseases, um, we're trying to break down the stigma and getting people to understand that this is not normal. This is not normal aging. It is a disease process. And there are things we can do. There aren't any cures, but there are definitely treatments. And there's a lot of things that we can do in order to prepare for what everyone will go through in life. And that will be the end of life. So each one travels that path in a different way. But um, the sooner you know what you're dealing with in any disease, just like if you have um, heart failure or um, a heart condition and, and you're at risk for stroke, well, knowing that and being able to take the steps that you need to take to prevent those mm-hmm. things, we now know that we can prevent some of the um, decline in um, cognition with Alzheimer's disease and other dementias if we make the right lifestyle changes. So my big push within the public is just getting people to recognize if you see a change, see a doctor. And that's the big thing. That's that's been the first plan of attack with this podcast is, you know, I think my loved one's having problems or we've been, they've gotten a diagnosis. My mom knew she had memory issues. She specifically told me that she did not want to end up like her mom. Mm-hmm. And I remember looking at her thinking, well, okay, fine. What do you want me to do? Because it was very obvious that was what was going to happen. We had a business together and she would take orders from clients with no directions, no due dates, no information, which made it a little challenging to handle. And then sure. occasionally I would say, you know, what are we supposed to be doing with, you know, Mrs. Smith's order? And she'd look at it and say, well, I didn't take that order. Like, uh, yeah, you did. Oh, boy. <laughs> yeah. So it was not fun. She mm-hmm. was not diagnosed officially until she was in a late stage of Alzheimer's, which is frustrating. And it was September of 2011. So I know in the last few years conversations like we're having podcasts radio shows there's just a lot more information out there and um my i'm working on advocacy and volunteering and this podcast to help spread the awareness like you said it isn't a normal part of aging here's the warning signs here's things you can do you know i've talked to personal trainers about the exercise and i've talked to people about nutrition and there's just a host of things we need to (laughs) We need to address so that we can age well. My paternal grandmother is 100, and she's fantastic. Her mind is great. She's physically great. Um, she's mostly blind from uh, glaucoma. That's her only <laughs> issue. So, But even still, because of the glaucoma and the, the significant blindness, there are things that should be done with her home that to make it safer, and she just resists. So definitely... We need to we need to take the stigma out of aging and memory loss. Well, agreed. And I mean, at one time, not too long ago, our families looked like the Waltons, True. where we had the grandparents, the parents, and the children all under the same roof or living next door to each other. Um, I had the the pleasure growing up as a child having my grandparents living two blocks down the street, and uh, two sets of uncles and an aunt also living two blocks away. So my mother's family all lived within two blocks of each other. Now, we don't even have um, our children, let alone our siblings or our extended family, within um, local distance that can support us. And so often we're relying on technology to check in and see how people are doing. And you get a false sense of, of security, Yes. My family is all close by, but it was still a challenge when my dad was on hospice. Mm -hmm. It was a 30 to 40 minute drive over there. I'd have to pick up his mom and it was just, you know, it just added to the stress of taking care of him. And I know people that are caring for parents long distance. I actually have a couple of them I'm planning on talking to soon. 
because mm-hmm. I, I can't imagine that. You know, you take your vacation time to fly halfway across the country or even further to deal with a situation that's not relaxing or enjoyable. And I'm just grateful that my family is all in the same general area. Mm-hmm. But I get, I get your point. There's a lot more um, multi-generational housing being built, and I think that's a great thing. Although I can't imagine living with my mom because she really does need constant supervision and she enjoys her memory community a lot because she has mm-hmm. other ladies like her. I have no idea what they talk about. They, but I, I, when I go to visit, she's sitting there chatting with these other ladies and they chat for hours. So That's wonderful. It is very yeah. wonderful. So. The social isolation and the number of individuals that we have that are dealing with this disease on their own, living independently, is scary. Yes. It's really scary. Yes. It's, it's unfortunate when we put my mom in the memory community... My sister half-jokingly tried to get our grandmother to consider the assisted living side of the community, and she just flatly refused. She said she was going to live in her home, die in her home, whatever. I'm sure everybody's heard stories like that. And I found that quite surprising because that's what my dad did, and it wasn't fun. It wasn't the, you know rainbows and unicorns of you know peace and happiness and all you know you hear that a lot about people on hospice it was a nightmare the entire way Mm -hmm. because he was diabetic he did not want to go back on dialysis and his memory overnight went from what I thought was fine but now I think he had cognitive issues more than we were aware of to he was thinking it was 1998 Mm -hmm. so overnight I had two parents with dementia and he didn't understand that we were fulfilling his wishes for his, you know, his advanced directive. He thought he was getting over the flu. He constantly battled the caregivers because he didn't want them to help him. So mm-hmm. we had fall issues. It was just, it was more challenged than it should have been. And I know if my Nana moved into the assisted living, if she could just try it for a month, she, mm-hmm. she would not go back. She would have all these, these wonderful people that she could, you know, essentially order around, you know, not rudely, but she'd have people at her beck and call and, it, and she'd love it. You know, she'd be yep. independent, but she'd have people taking care of her. It would, it would be great. And that's another avenue that I'm trying to help people understand is that, you know, assisted living is not as bad or ugly as people may think. It's expensive, so it's not an option for everyone, unfortunately, but it is something people need to consider more than they have in the past. Agreed. I uh, have also been an executive director in assisted living, um, specifically in memory care, and um, I've also heard from loved ones, as well as the individuals diagnosed, why didn't we do this sooner? Why didn't I come here? Yep. I I had one woman whose daughter thought she was going to have to bring her mom in kicking and screaming. So she went and got guardianship because mom was living alone in a house on the very edge of a very busy street. And she started wandering and she was afraid to death that she was going to get hit by a car. So she got the guardianship, brought mom in. Mom looked around and said, this place is beautiful. Can I live here? (laughs) I honestly thought I was going to have to pick the daughter up off the ground. I wish our experience moving mom in was like that. Unfortunately, we got the begging, the pleading. I don't belong here. Why are you doing this to me? Why can't I live with you? It was probably the worst day of my life. But I knew it was the right thing to do. Um, like I said, my mom is only 75. I am 51. My sister is 47. Mm. My sister has school aged children. My dad died one month after my daughter moved out. So it's like, I'm not in the position to stop working and Mm -hmm. take care of my mom. And I know after a week, one of us would be dead because I don't have that kind of 
patience and tolerance, and I just wasn't ready to put my life on hold. And my grandmother lived to 91, so at the time we thought, you know, mom might live 15 years, and I'm not waiting 15 years to to do the things that I wanted to do once my daughter moved out. So, yeah, it was, mm-hmm. it was not a good... Last year was a rough year, but that's okay. This year's better. I'm good. But let's... um. Let's move forward and maybe you can kind of walk people through what we think our loved ones might be going through, maybe like at each stage of the disease. Um, Sure. Uh, In the very early stages, um, they may not even recognize that there are some problems. They may not pick up on it or they may be very attuned to the fact that there's changes occurring and no one else is picking up. It depends on the individual. Each person is an individual. Each person goes through their path very differently. There may be stages within the disease, but everybody's different. You put three people in the room and you're not going to find that the three people are are, um, the same in any way, shape, or form. So why should a disease be the same? True. True. So um, depending on what disease it is, and that's one of the big pieces that I'm pushing for, is people getting a differential diagnosis. Way too often, either statistics are showing us some research from the Alzheimer's Association shows that only 45% of the people with the condition are told of their diagnosis. Wow. We're back to where we were 40 years ago with cancer when the doctors didn't tell someone they had cancer because they didn't have a cure. So we have people that are going to doctors and they may recognize there's a problem, but they're not giving them a diagnosis, either because they haven't identified what the cause is or they're afraid to tell them what the etiology is. So the most important thing that anyone can do for a loved one or yourself, if you see a change in behavior, you see a change in um, ability, whatever it might be, change means something's happening. So it needs to be addressed and watched carefully. And if you don't feel you're being heard, then it's important to go on to an expert. Uh, Going to research centers, they can tap you into... um, clinical trials and early uh, diagnostic procedures that won't cost anything because it's covered by research. So it's really important. If you go to the doctor, say you notice the dad just is not, he's falling or he's um, having some problems with his memory, not able to process information the way he used to. And you take him to the doctor and the doctor does a basic physical Um, and asks him to remember three words and turns to you and says, oh, he's fine. Please go on to someone else. Uh, We had a really bad experience with my dad where we thought we were meeting with with a neurologist. And um, the neurologist turned to me and said, well, I don't know why you're here because I don't include family when making a diagnosis. Oh, my gosh. And I looked at him and said, so you're going to rely on the person who can't always remember, tell you what's going on? So I knew we were in the wrong place. So you really have to trust your gut and uh, follow up. But the the big thing is, is that if they go through and they say, okay, yeah, you do have a bit of a memory problem. Here's a prescription for aerosepical condition, a reversible condition that it's not Alzheimer's or other forms of dementia. If they haven't done a CAT scan, they may miss out that you have normal pressure hydrocephalus, which is a buildup of cerebral spinal fluid um, in the brain, or there could be a tumor. Um, There could be a um, nutritional uh, deficiency. It could be a hormonal deficiency. Um, I met one family where um, dad was identified with frontotemporal dementia, one of the more rare forms, but um, it's out there. And they were told, you know, this is is very progressive, typically five years. And he was a CPA. He sold off his practice and put everything in irrevocable trusts in order to protect his family. Five years into the disease, it hasn't progressed. And the daughter says to him, Dad, something's not right. We were told that 
that you had a life expectancy of five years and it really hasn't changed. I think we need to go to get another opinion. The man had Lyme disease. Oh dear. oh, dear. Once they treated his Lyme disease, his cognitive function returned. But everything was put in irrevocable trusts. So again, if you don't get the right diagnosis, you may be missing something that can be treated. So that's, that's one of the big things that I push for is that early diagnosis, early conversations with families, because our loved ones are recognizing that something's wrong. So let's address it as a medical problem, find out what's going wrong, and um, it may not be Alzheimer's or other dementias. And I keep saying other dementias because uh, one of the things I want people to realize is that only 60% of those people with cognitive decline are identified as having Alzheimer's. We now have tests that we can use to identify whether it's Alzheimer's or not. We don't have to wait for someone to pass and do an autopsy anymore. We now have the F-18 scan and the A-16 scan, which are scans that look at the buildup of the um, amyloid and tau proteins in the brain. And if they're there, then you have Alzheimer's. But if they're not there, you don't. So um, only about 60% of the people that are being diagnosed. So we have people that are very misdiagnosed. Yeah, that the second, uh, I'm sorry? That doesn't surprise me. Mm. The second most common form of dementia is Lewy body dementia. Um, it used to be vascular dementia, but vascular dementia is now the third leading cause. It's gone down because we've implemented lifestyle changes for those people that have heart conditions and blood pressure issues and managing um, your diet and exercise. So we're not, and how we manage strokes now, uh, now having TPA in order to administer when someone's having a stroke within two hours, we can um, reduce the effect of the strokes. So we're seeing a major decrease in the vascular dementias but an increase in, in Lewy body dementias, which is related to um, Parkinson's disease. So knowing the different symptoms and knowing how they present also helps the caregiver to be able to help that person with the areas that they're having difficulty with. It's not uncommon for someone with Lewy body disease to have hallucinations or to have what's known as REM sleep disorder, where they fall out of bed in the middle of the night and we don't know why, or the partner is getting hit or punched or kicked. Um, oh, yeah. Um, my dad never got a diagnosis. Um, at one point, they said, well, let's throw this medicine at him and see, it, see if it sticks. But based on his symptoms, I would bet my last dollar that my dad had Lewy body. He had the REM sleep disorder. He had a night where he had a dream. He was playing tag and he finally woke up when his head hit the wall across the bedroom when he ran out of bed. Oh boy. Oh, boy. So he had multiple falls um, and um, he had a tremor. So he had many, many symptoms that go along with it. But the other thing is that you can have a mixed dementia. So you can have Alzheimer's and vascular dementia or you can have Lewy body and Alzheimer's. So it's the fact that we're getting so much closer to understanding the diseases is actually making it a little more complicated to understand. Of course. Of course. Mm -hmm. But the first thing definitely is to, to get a proper diagnosis and then get hooked into um, the right organization that can help give you support. Um, making early decisions, having those conversations with your family and your loved ones as to what you want. Now, there's no reason why we have to wait until we have a, a diagnosis like Alzheimer's or other dementias um, to have that conversation. It would be helpful for our loved ones to know what our final wishes are, no matter what stage. We don't know when our final days will be. So having those conversations early and openly um, can definitely make it easier on the caregivers and those that are left behind or those that are providing the care. Yeah, my, my um, dad's advanced directive excuse me, helped a lot. He ended up in the hospital for a month 
where they mm -hmm. put him on the dialysis and they said once they cleaned the toxins out of his system, his memory would probably come back. After 32 days, they released him and he knew he had a gap in his memory. And my sister was very, very hopeful that it would improve from there. And I'm a bit more pessimistic, which isn't always good. And I, I figured after 32 days, if his memory hadn't come back 100%, it wasn't going to. And unfortunately, I was correct. It was about three days, four days after he'd been released. He fell and he hit his head on the step. Oh, no. Because he was not willing to use a walker. He wasn't willing to have the caregivers help him. And he ended up in a different hospital where they said eventually, you know, it was within a few days that his heart wasn't strong enough for dialysis and they were trying to walk this fine line between the medication for the heart and the dialysis and big, long, drawn-out discussion on all that. And I finally was talking, I was on the phone with the kidney doctor and I said, you know, we're in a very dark gray area of not respecting his advanced directive. And she immediately pivoted to talking about hospice, which I was so grateful for because mm -hmm. his primary um, neurologist, no, not neurologist, the kidney doctor, that mm -hmm. name just slipped my mind. She, when I started talking to her about hospice, she hung up on me, which was a pretty unpleasant situation considering I was trying to do what was right for everybody. So it's definitely, I've made sure my family knows what I want. And, you know, down to, if there's any working parts left, please donate them to somebody who needs them. We've been mm -hmm. very clear about our final wishes, and none of us are that old. But I had a serious bicycle accident a couple years ago, so, it, you know, like you said, we're never sure when our end days are. Mine could have been two years ago. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, I was wearing a helmet, so all I did was okay. come out with a broken collarbone. Oh, boy. Yes, so... You know, but it was interesting dealing with my dad because he he had no concept that his memory, after the first few days home, he had no concept that his memory was bad. It was uh -huh. interesting. Like, my mom doesn't either. Although mm -hmm. occasionally she'll say either senility is setting in or she'll make the comment that her memory is not as good as it used to be, which is almost impossible not to laugh at because it's 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 either funny or it's just so super depressing. Sad. Yeah. So when she makes that comment, I just kind of laugh and and tell her, yeah, none of us have good memories anymore. And move on. There you go. I've learned That's from my Alzheimer's Association support group that and the community that we moved her into that you know fiblets or not inviting mom to our reality is the best way to deal with things because reminding her that. My dad is gone, is almost cruel. She actually doesn't seem to remember that he's gone. You know, we just, I just, I just go with her reality because it's much easier than trying to drag her into mine because that never works. Absolutely. Um, as a student of occupational therapy, you know, we were taught reality orientation and, and trying to bring them back to, um, what is going on in reality and and you can't convince a diseased brain of what is reality because their their perception of the reality is altered and it's because the brain is diseased uh, they're actually losing brain cells so no you do have to get into their reality and and meet them wherever they are because that's going to cause the least amount of stress the least amount of of aggravation and and agitation um and actually can be a lot more enjoyable yeah, for everyone. I agree. I agree with that. So, um, but what else are they going through? They're also recognizing that they, they just can't do things the way they used to. And it's hard because they want to be independent. They, you know, that's what they've been all their lives or at least adult lives. And um, it's very, very frustrating I mean, if you've ever been sick, like after your, your biking accident and you can't do the things you used to do, it's frustrating. And sometimes we take our frustration out on those that are nearest to us. Um, so 
that's where the dynamic between the care partner and the individual diagnosed can get frustrating. And I think my dad needed to learn that because he would get very frustrated with mom. I, I think he tried to keep bringing her back into our reality because I don't think he ever heard of the alternative. He just, mm -hmm. It just seemed like he was always fighting her memory loss in a negative way. And I know it didn't help her and it didn't help him. And sometimes it was difficult to be around the two of them because he would get so frustrated with her and then she'd get angry with him and it was just, it was a challenge and I didn't really know how to help them because I wasn't sure how to help me. And so after, after dealing with all that, and after his passing, you know, I went looking for more information because as I said, my mom is at a later stage, although she's so physically healthy that it's, it's difficult to spend time with her because I start getting a little crazy but she obviously says the same things over and over and you know after 20 minutes I'm like you know I have 15 other things I got to do so I've I've been taking her out and I know mm -hmm. my dad kind of resisted doing that because it was a challenge and the research is time consuming so I started a podcast so people could just listen while they're doing other things and hopefully avoid some of the upsets and dramas that my dad dealt with at the end of his life and you know my sister and I deal with while we take care of mom and oh, it's a very ugly disease. It is but one of the things that I, I hope to get people to to keep looking at is rather than looking at the losses look at what they still have and even with advanced dementia everyone still needs a purpose they still need um to feel like they can make a difference, that they can participate, that they can um, enjoy life. And it's so important to look at each individual and what their life passions were, what their, their um, how they gained enjoyment, things that, that were pleasurable for them and try and build those into their daily life. One, it's like, you know, you have a choice whether you're going to look at the sky and say, oh gosh, all there are clouds or I see little spots of blue, of blue breaking through. The sun, the sun is trying to come through. Let's look at all those positive pieces and how can they help? What skills do they still have to help? Because um, that makes them feel like an adult again. That makes them feel purposeful. And uh, it's really important to, to, to look at those positive sides. I, I've, heard, I've, I've, I've heard the, what do they say, they, to simplify some of the things they enjoyed doing. And my mom was very creative. She painted. She was a seamstress. She actually did some pretty nice woodworking mm -hmm. later in life. And I've tried with the activities in her community, you know, to get her to do the little crafts and the painting. And with me, she resists and tells me she can't or she doesn't want to. With a friend of mine whose mom was my mom's neighbor, she had to move out because of a fall. She could get her to do those things. And it was really frustrating to me. But because I don't enjoy spending time just sitting and having the same conversation every three minutes, I take my mm -hmm. mom out. And a couple mm -hmm. of the adventures we've had out just this week, I took her to our city park with a little picnic lunch. There's a splash zone um, for the kids to play in to cool off. Yep. Which this week, you know, it's 102 degrees today, so that's a, you know, it's a nice <laughs> place to go. And I figured probably be full of kids. Her friend from the community wanted to go, and her daughters were thrilled that I was willing to take her. The friend is more conversational than my mom, so it sometimes is a little easier to deal with the two of them together than my mom individually. But they yep. enjoyed watching those kids. Oh, absolutely. I thought at one point, you know, it was very pleasant. We were sitting in the shade. The breeze was blowing by. But after an hour and a half, I was like, the temperature is increasing. If these ladies don't want to go back home soon, I'm going to melt into a puddle, and they're going to be <laughs> stuck here. And fortunately... 
the friend does like afternoon naps and she started telling me that she was getting sleepy and my yeah. mom, it was interesting. My mom was getting concerned that she didn't know where her room was. And ah. I said, Oh, that's okay. That's cause we're, you know, we're at the park having a picnic, but both of these ladies are moms and grandmas and just watching the kids from very small to maybe middle school. Yes. It, they just had a blast and it made it easy. I just kind of sat there and enjoyed the weather and, I enjoyed watching the kids and, you know, it was, it's not the most stimulating way to spend a couple of hours, but it was, it was nice. And I'm trying to figure out what kind of things like that I can do when it's cold and wet. Mm -hmm. Cause you know, but despite the 102 it, degrees today, that, that will be coming back. <laughs> that it will, but it's definitely more stimulating than sitting in front of a television yes, and she, vegging yes, out. She, she does not track TV shows anymore. Mm -hmm. So she, we, she doesn't do that. You know, she mm. doesn't appear to be able to, um, what's, she doesn't translate words from text. Like, mm -hmm. I know she knows how to read, but she doesn't seem to process the written word like she and used to. Yep. Her friend still reads, although I find it really interesting because... You know, you put down a novel for a couple of days, and sometimes you got to back up and go, "Where was I? What was what? What part of the story was I in?" But I have right. no idea how she tracks books. But you know, obviously, she cannot tell me, and I don't see her daughters very often, so I don't, I don't get to ask. But it's interesting because mm -hmm. she's always got a book handy. You know, my mom doesn't pay attention to the TV in her room or the one in the in the TV room in the community. Sometimes I just, I think, wow, I don't know how she, she stays so calm. I've heard horror stories about people living with Alzheimer's being violent, getting just really frustrated and upset and lashing out physically. And I understand mm -hmm. why that happens. And I'm so grateful my mom doesn't go through that. But yep. sometimes I watch her and I think, okay, two minutes has gone by. And so she doesn't remember what happened. Two minutes ago it's just it's very hard to fathom and to comprehend it is it is to get into the it's difficult to get into their shoes and and see how they're processing everything but the most important thing is just finding a way to make them happy um music has an incredible impact on people with memory impairments uh, because memories that are attached to songs. Now, I'm going to give a little about me, which just so it kind of really, I could never watch music videos or MTV because whenever I heard a song, what I would immediately get in my head was the vision of what was put on the screen from MTV or music videos. So I avoided them like the plague because I associated music with memories and experiences that I had. And I always liked the way that that felt when I heard that song come back on. So music is stored in the brain in a whole different way than other memories are because it's deeply rooted with emotion. So those songs that you first dance to at your wedding or graduation or, or um, had a, a connection of some sort. Uh, I have several different songs that I think of and I, and I think of the very first dance that I went to when I was in seventh grade. So it's, it's, it's really important to tap into what's good or what's a good memory for that individual. Um, I mean, my daughter knows she better never play rap for me. <laughs> rap makes me agitated. I don't like it. I'm much better with music from the 60s, 70s and 80s. Um, if I'm feeling down, I need that kind of music that I can dance to or I can sing to, to, to lift my spirits. And, um, Music has just shown tremendous um, benefits for those people with memory impairment, especially those in advanced dementia. Well, I'll have to keep searching for songs that my mom seems to connect to. Mm -hmm. She stayed home with my sister and I, and she would turn on TVs in the back of the house and in the family room. So as she went about taking care of the house and dealing with, you know, all the household chores, there would be talking and mental stimulation. And she also listened 
to a lot of talk radio back in the day. Mm-hmm. She probably loved podcasts now if, if that was something she could process. And I haven't yes. found anything other than Christmas carols that she mm-hmm. seems to connect to. But mm-hmm. I will go back and I will try some of the music from the 70s because, my, yeah. you know, that was when my sister and I were really young. And um, I know my dad listened to more then, so maybe it'll connect with her. But it's been a challenge to find things other than nature and children that mm-hmm. kind of brings her out of the repetitive fog. I mean, she still repeats things, but she seems more, a little bit more alert when we're at the park or there's a regional park very close to her community with hills and, you know, oak trees and the very best of Northern California's landscape. Mm -hmm. And back in February, I drove her up there just to get out of the community and she just loved it. So as soon as it warmed up, I took her back and we just wandered around and then a week later my husband and I went and had a picnic with her and it's it you know she just loves it so you know I try to do more of that I've taken her to a I think it's also another regional park we have a lot of parks in our area that has Uh like a lagoon type pool it has the beach entry so you can just walk in um, unfortunately, it also has sand in it, which was a little odd for even for me, but we just sat there and watched the kids, and she just loved it. And it was yes. interesting because she noticed the um, demographic makeup of the families there was a little different than what I grew up with. I thought that was mm-hmm. kind of interesting that she noticed that and mm-hmm. could articulate it. So it's, you know, there's those little things that's like, oh, you know, there's still some... There's still some spark left in that brain, but it's few and far between. But right. that's been one of my biggest challenges, is trying to figure out how how to spend time with her that doesn't just absolutely make me nuts because, you know, she asks me the same question 15 times in 20 minutes. Mm-hmm. And, like you know, like you said, the music and simplifying their hobbies, it's just that those two things haven't worked yet for me. <laughs> Oh, okay. Um, well, I definitely find, and research is showing us that keeping them socially engaged, so that social piece of the, the arts and crafts or the, the painting, if she can do it with other people in the community, and you, you kind of sit back a little bit and, and just add your two cents in every once in a while, as opposed to one-on-one, um, you know... Once a mother, always a mother, mm-hmm. and once a daughter, always a daughter. And um, when people start trying to take over your role, uh, it can be difficult. I mean, my mom and I have had this conversation ourselves, and it's like, you know, yeah, she's an adult, she's a mom, and and it was always her job to take care of you. So it's hard for them to recognize. Um, the frustration that they're experiencing when they see that you're now taking care of them because that makes them feel like less of a person. One of Um, of the ways I address that with my mom, she'll make a comment, well, how did you get to be in charge? Or why is it that you're taking care of me now? Those type of comments. I just, I just kind of laughingly nudge her and say, you know, you're retired, you know, it's, it's your time to have people do things for you because you worked so hard and you've raised kids and dealt with grandkids. And so I, I go about it that way. So it's kind of like a positive because yes. it helps me. I had to take her clothes shopping about a year ago and she kept saying, how did you get to be the mother? How did you get to, and it was like, Oh my God, it was so, It was, she repeated it so many times that I refer to it as like a death by a thousand cuts because it was Uh like, can we just buy the clothes you need so your pants don't fall off? You know, Mm -hmm. because she'd lost weight. Mm -hmm. And the next time we went out shopping, I had come up with the, I'd probably read it somewhere with the, you know, oh, hey, you know, it's, 
you know, I'm not taking care of you. We're, we're just shopping together or, you know, you're retired now. And so it's your turn to have people, you know, wait on you and do things for you. And she seemed to accept that. So that worked and hopefully Absolutely. it'll continue to work. Yep. Most important thing is trying to allow them to perceive that they're still in the same role that they're in. There's no reason to, to bring them back to now reality of you now being in the decision-making role um, because it makes them feel like less of an adult. And, and that's hard. But the theory of retrogenesis, which has um, been pointed out, um, the progression of dementia, is the absolute inverse of normal development. And Claudia Allen, um, who's an occupational therapist, did the Allen cognitive levels. And when you look at the seven levels or the seven different um, stages of dementia and you look at uh, normal development, for those individuals that are, are really mid to moderate stage, if you look at normal development, they're really around the three to five year level as far as brain function is concerned. So to say that they are children, that is not true. They are still adults, but their brain is now functioning at a level that is equal to what it was when they were three to five years of age. Um, so having those meltdowns or having those, those frustrations so they can't verbalize what they went through, it is just like dealing with your toddler or preschooler. Um, and you have to, to treat them with dignity and respect and meet them wherever you can in order to make them feel more at ease and um, feel safe. Because that's one of the big things is that they really begin to not feel safe because they can't trust what's happening because they can't remember. Yeah, I've read that. It's, it's interesting. And it's, and it's helpful the way you're verbalizing it. I'm sure it's going to help a lot of people. Oh, good. I've, you know, because my mom is at such a later stage, she's likely in stage six. Mm -hmm. I haven't had some of the experiences that other people have had there. You know, I've got listeners that I've communicated with who are taking care of parents in the parents' home while trying to maintain their own home. And they're, you know, it's, it's just like a weekly challenge of what to do now and how to handle, like you said, maintaining their dignity and treating them like an adult, even though their brain functions like a toddler, which is toddlers are frustrating as it is. So when your parent acts that way, it's even worse. True. But we don't want to treat them like a toddler. Right. We want to recognize what can they process? What can they understand? And how can we present it in an adult like fashion? Um, and that's hard. It's really hard to, to find that right mix. So that's where it's so important to, to, to meet each individual wherever they are functioning, even that day. I mean, one of the, the, the tricky parts with Louis body dementia is that fluctuations in someone's abilities are dramatic throughout the day or maybe from one day to the next. One day they might seem like they're right on key and there's no problem. And the next day they are nobody's home. And um, it's really hard to understand when you see those dramatic changes, but you have to be the one that can flex and adapt because they can't. That's interesting. There's a couple of women in my support group whose spouses have that exact makeup of their, their personality, for lack of a better term. They're, you know, some days they think, Oh, okay, we're we're okay. Maybe the doctor was wrong, and then a couple days later, it's like, what in the heck happened? Yep. So maybe they have the wrong diagnosis, or I know, like my mom, a lot of the care providers in my support group are having difficulty getting their loved one to get a diagnosis. Mm-hmm. So. And, and how we come to identifying the root cause of, of the dementia is by eliminating everything else. 
So it, it is it is not an easy task. We don't have yet, they're working on it, but we don't yet have a blood test that can identify it. We've got some, some genetic coding that we can do that, that can tell us whether you're carrying the gene, but it doesn't tell you what your brain function is at. So it really requires a whole team of individuals involved looking at the the physical components, the neuropsychological components, the psycho the psychological piece that goes along with it, and um, and it it's it's a great big picture because the one thing that controls us all is our brain, and it regulates all of our systems and and it makes us who we are, and when we start to have these disease processes attacking the brain in the various different ways that they do then they present in different manners. That's true. That true. Um, wasn't totally aware of the blood test. I have read a book called The End of Alzheimer's. They think there's like 36 factors, you know, including nutrition and exercise and sleep and all those good things that mm-hmm. contribute to cognitive decline or Alzheimer's, obviously. So it's interesting that they think they might have a blood test that can help diagnose. So there is um, a blood test that they're using in Australia and Japan right now where they can identify the amyloid plaque in the blood system. Um, It has not yet um, made its way to the U.S. and been approved yet here. Um, I don't know what its reliability is, but they are beginning to use it. Um, it's easier than doing a lumbar puncture, which you can do a, um, a lumbar puncture and see the amyloid and the tau in the cerebral spinal fluid. And then you can do the, the new um, F18 scan and the A16 scans. But neither of those are covered by Medicare services because they're so expensive. Um, but the one thing that we do know is that the use of those diagnostic tools can tell us whether we have the right diagnosis or not. If you do the scan and they don't have the amyloid or the tau, they don't have Alzheimer's. Done. So um, it's it's important for us to get to a point where we can can truly diagnose it. But there's not a, there's a, a recent article put out by Bill Gates because um, he's now very invested in trying to help find a cure for Alzheimer's disease. And there, he was talking about how there is no market out there to find a real diagnostic tool because what happens when we diagnose it? We don't have a cure. So that's part of the problem that we have with doctors not providing the diagnoses because they don't feel they can help. Um, so they say, yeah, there's mild cognitive impairment. Let's take this medication and see how that's going and but we may be missing something. So it's, it's important to get that, that true diagnosis. It seems like <laughs> diagnosing earlier would be advantageous to the research because once they are, you know, have cognitive impairment or, you know, more extreme cognitive impairment, it's hard to know what to do. I've read lots of things where they say, oh, well, when you show signs of cognitive impairment, you might have had the disease or the issues. I've read anywhere from 10 years to 30 years prior to showing symptoms. And it's like, yikes, 30 years. That's true. But that's, that's where they're hoping that they're going to be able to get to the point where if they can find a disease modifying drug that can stop laying down the amyloid and the tau, if we can identify it early, then we can stop the progression of the disease. So that's one of the big areas of research right now. Um, We know that once the disease has progressed to the point where you've got identified dementia, um, we can't fix the the dead cells. Um, A healthy brain weighs about three pounds. Someone with advanced dementia, their brain only weighs about a pound. We're literally losing brain cells. But that doesn't mean that we can't gain them. So all the new research that's out there as far as exercise and social and intellectual stimulation and um, a a good, healthy Mediterranean-style diet 
Um, we can actually still create new brain cells even into our 80s. So we can make new connections. So as long as we're, we are taking the um, positive approaches towards our lifestyle, they've actually seen where they've taken someone with mild cognitive impairment and reversed them back to normal cognition by implementing the right lifestyle choices. So there are things we can do, you know, and we need to take control of where we can take control. That is very true. So do you have any last advice for people who might be dealing with loved ones with mild to moderate cognitive impairment? First and foremost, get a definitive diagnosis. Um, and if you don't feel that you're being taken seriously by the doctor that you're going to, I would go straight to a research center um, because they can tap into all of the research um, studies that are available at no cost to you. So that, that would be my first thing. And second, adapt a healthy lifestyle. All of us now, make sure that you're getting exercise five to seven days a week um, aerobic exercise for 30 minutes a day, uh, the Mediterranean diet or the mind diet, M I N D diet, which is a combination of the heart healthy diet and the Mediterranean diet mm -hmm. we know has a significant impact on healthy brain tissue. Um, and social stimulation is critical and intellectual stimulation, making sure that you're trying new things. Your brain wakes up when you try new tasks, learn an instrument, learn a, um, a, lang a second language, or if you know a second language or once knew a second language, bring it back again and, and test your brain and do things that are, are not typical. If you're a person that does the crossword puzzle every Sunday, you're really good at doing crossword puzzles, but your brain adapts, so it's important to try something new. Terrific. Well, I well, very much appreciate all the advice today. My pleasure. And I will definitely put your website link on our show notes so that people can hear more from you and contact you if they have questions. Thank you. I've got other um, radio programs that I've done that are on there, and um, people can certainly reach out to me to inquire about any other trainings that I can offer. That would be fantastic. <laughs> Well, you have a wonderful rest of the day, and I look forward to chatting with you again in the future. Absolutely. Thank you. You're welcome. I hope you found that conversation as helpful and as lightning as I did. As again, we had dis planned on discussing how to kind of figure out what's going on in your loved one's brain, and I was just recently at a talk with Laura Wyman the Dementia Whisperer, and I'm going to try to put together something with her or at least give you the highlights of that conversation that I was part of because it was useful. I've seen her speak twice. I've actually read her book twice, and I think that information goes great with what we heard today. So, again, thanks so much for tuning in. I appreciate all the new listeners that I'm getting every week. For those of you who haven't, please, please go to iTunes or Google Play and leave us a rating and review. That's really, truly the best way for new people to find out about Fading Memories, to find out the support that I'm offering and, you know, help spread the word. I really appreciate it. And you guys have a fantastic rest of the week. Email me or leave a voicemail message on the website if you've got questions or topics you'd like me to research and provide for you. And again, I'll talk to you again next week. Thanks so much.